Thanks for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa and our special show on presidential and parliamentary elections in Ghana. So Ghanaians went to the polls on Monday. There are 12 candidates in total in the race for the top job. But out in front are two familiar faces, incumbent Nana akufo Addo of the New Patriotic Party, or NPP, and his predecessor, former leader John Mahama of the National Democratic Congress, or NDC. Now, he led for four years until he was unseated by akufo Addo in 2016. Voting took place across 38,000 polling stations. Our Sam Bradpiece has been keeping an eye on things for us, and he joins me now. Sam, so how did things pan out on Monday? Well, really, Georgia, as you might expect from a country which is held up as a beacon of stability within the West African region, things seem to go really quite smoothly. At polling stations we visited, some of the Electoral Commission staff there said that actually turnout had been even higher than last time around, back in 2016. Of course, we don't yet have any global turnout figures for this election, um, but that, that will come in surely in due time. Now, things, as I said, went smoothly, but no election is perfect, of course. And there were a couple of isolated incidents. Two members of staff from the Electoral Commission were actually arrested after having been caught tampering with ballot boxes. But that kind of thing really was the exception rather than the rule here. Now, it's worth remembering that this election played out in the context of a global pandemic. Ghana has had more than 50,000 cases of coronavirus. And what this meant was during the campaign season, there were far fewer kind of big rallies and large political meetings that you might ordinarily expect. At least that was the case in Accra during during our time here. Now, again, when it comes to coronavirus, some Ghanaian voters that I spoke to said that actually the government's handling of the crisis has actually pushed them closer towards the NPP, the ruling party, because they say the government has demonstrated some competence in terms of its management of the crisis. And also a big winner, of course, here in Ghana is that the Ghanaian Premier League kicked off once again back in September, uh, once those social distancing measures were slightly relaxed. Great. Thanks very much, Sam, for staying with us. Now, Sam sent us a couple of reports on some of the big issues that the country has been facing in the run-up to Monday's election. We'll be looking at that a little shortly. But as he mentioned, Ghana is one of the region's most democratic countries. This is its eighth election since the return of multi-party democracy in 1992. And for nearly three decades now, all transfers of power have been peaceful. To continue this smooth transition, smooth tradition of smooth handovers, Akufa Addo and Mahama signed a symbolic peace pact on Friday. The dependability of the system is something that voters of all stripes value greatly. In, in, a, in a democracy, we all have different concepts, different ideas. And you know, all politics is about idea, not about fighting, not about anything. So that's why we are here to exercise our franchise by voting. Ghana is a beautiful country. We can't afford to create any fight in Ghana. So we are peaceful people. So nothing will happen. And by the end of the, the end of the day, what I think this candidate can do for me is what he's the one I'm going to vote for. So for more on this, I'm joined now by Gilf Guild Fred Aziama from the Pan African Research, Net Research Network Afrobarometer. Uh, Gilfred, thanks very much for speaking to us. Now, uh, nowhere's perfect, and uh, Ghana, you know, has its problems. For example, uh, an endemic problem with corruption in the public sector, inequality is still a major issue. But in comparison to other West African countries, its democratic mechanisms are solid. So, what's it doing differently to some of its neighbours? Well, first of all, um, I think it is worth noting that um, we haven't had it smoothly um, since independence. This is Ghana's fourth republic. So we have gone through struggles in the past. But coming into the fourth republic, we have seen much of political party participation in the electoral processes. So first of all, there is broad elite consensus among the political parties and also popular support for democracy um, as a system of governance that Ghanaians want to go with. So that is first of all. Second one, there have been various contestations over the involvement of political parties in the past. And through that, we have established some mechanisms. So we have 
Interparty Advisory Committee at the National where all political parties meet to discuss salient issues pertaining to the elections. So all the stakeholders in the electoral um, system are engaged, discussed, and they discuss very important issues to make sure they do not degenerate into violence or any other thing that would disturb the elections. Again, um, we have also a very transparent system um, for our political um, 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 organization. Somewhere in 1996, the political parties have to struggle over even the ballot uh, boxes that we were using. It went to court before it was made transparent. So there have been some litigations, there have been some struggles, but all of them have shaped up in the institutional way that we organize our elections. Again, our electoral commission um, has proven to be very credible. They are operationally solid in terms of how they organize elections. And the consensus building uh, they put into this organization has made the political parties to generally um, believe in the competence of the electoral commission. So the transparency and the contestations which have shaped the institutionalization of the organization of elections, I believe, um, has helped in a, in a larger way to ensure that our elections are very credible. And then whenever there are contestations, I think we all have agreed that contestations should be resolved through the legal means. So in 2012, okay. when we had contestations around our elections, we settled them um, at the Supreme Court. Guildford, thank you so much for that insight. Now, I'm going to ask you to stick around for the rest of our show. We'll be hearing back from Guildford a little bit later on. But for now, let's have a look at some of the other issues that voters were facing. Now, their choices are more likely to be affected by candidates' positions on key issues than by any other considerations. Along with unemployment, infrastructure and health, education is a big concern. In 2017, Akufa Adu made senior high school free. Attendance has soared by 50%. And the president has been banking on support from graduates and their families. Mahama says that the scheme is flawed and has promised to further reform it. Sam Bradpeace went to speak to those most affected. 21-year-old Soja Evans is among the first cohort of Ghanaians to benefit from free SHS, senior high school education. The policy, introduced in 2017, has seen high school attendance soar from 800,000 back then to 1.2 million students now. Free SHS has been my saviour because it helped me to achieve my first aim, which is the education. Soja didn't set foot in a school until the age of 14. His family were too poor to send him. If there had been no free SHS, Soja would have stayed at the Volta River catching fish like he was doing before. President Akufo Addo is banking on support from graduates and their families to stay in power. Hundreds of thousands of graduates have formed an association to publicly champion the free SHS policy. Soja is among them. So we are standing to protect the future of the free SHS. We are standing that if any government will come and, make, uh, and think that he is coming to abolish the free SHS, we are going to stand and say no, we are beneficiary and our future generation have to also benefit from it. But policy experts have reservations about free SHS. A double-track system was introduced to reduce overcrowding. One half of the student body studies while the other takes holiday, with each group taking it in turns. There's increased enrollment, but that did not come, was not accompanied with increase in invest, invest, investments in infrastructure to take care of the kids. So the only way the government could deal with the overcrowding was to do it in shifts, right? The question is, how many contact hours do these students need to be able to study? Because typically it's just two and a half years. So a bit of contact hours have been lost. The opposition has said that if they win power, they will scrap double track. Less than a week from the election, they promised to cover the full fees of university students beginning their studies in 2020-21. Well, the economy is also at the forefront of many minds. Like everywhere, 2020 and the pandemic weighed heavily and the powerhouse saw its first contraction in nearly four decades. However, prior to that, Ghana saw GDP average close to a huge 7% over the last decade. Poverty is down, but whilst millions have seen living standards improve, regional inequalities are stark. Our correspondents visited the Volta region in the east, where chronic underdevelopment and hardship 
are contributing to growing separatist sentiments. Take a look. In Ghana's Volta region, one in three people live below the poverty line. This director of an NGO based in the regional capital, Ho, says that the government is partly responsible. A lot of people are complaining about sanitation issues, water, toilet facilities, even our health centres are not in good shape. Chantal Clou collaborates with the NGO, teaching beading and baking skills to local women to help them become economically independent. I think employment is the main problem. So I've been looking for a platform to mount and reach out my fellow women and as well as the youths. Many here feel they've been left out of Ghana's economic boom and that's fueling old resentments. <laughs> Separatists have been calling for the independence of Western Togoland, a vast area that includes the Volta region. They do not recognise the legitimacy of a 1956 plebiscite when the area chose to be absorbed into modern-day Ghana. Back in September, gunmen allegedly belonging to a separatist group attacked the bus station here in Ho, setting fire to these two buses here. They also attacked police stations in towns to the south. A representative of a different pro-independence group which claims to be non-violent spoke to us from hiding. So if there's a proper union where we too we can have a say, where our minerals can be used to develop our people so that we can also control and have access to our future, then that will be fine. But until then, nothing is going to change our mind. Analysts say there's a clear link between the increase in separatist sentiment and regional underdevelopment. If somebody is, is so angry, you want to look at why the person is angry. Probably he's hungry. And you don't see development there. And whether you like it or not, poverty would work to supplant peace of any country. President Akufo Addo has vowed to crush the separatist movement. While successive governments have promised to develop the Volta region, the poverty rate here remains the same as in 2005. So I'm going to turn back to Guildford now. Guildford, thanks for staying with us. Now, uh, as we saw there, uh, Ghana is doing pretty well, but some are being left behind. Uh, why, why so? Why, when a country has seen so much growth over the last 10 years, we still have such a problem of inequality? Well, that's, that's certainly um, true. When you look at the time we begin, uh, you look at the time we began to experience this high growth, um, it coincides with the time when we had um, got the oil. So we were exploring oil around 2011, 2012. So we started increasing high GDP growth. So um, the growth has been very biased towards the oil sector, which employs few people. Um, at the same time, we haven't made much gains in the agricultural sector, which employs majority of Ghanaians, where they get their livelihood. So um, that bias growth has contributed even to some people um, becoming more poor between 2013 and 2017. The Ghana Statistical Service um, gave us the inequality, uh, a snapshot of the inequality throughout the country. And we recognize that even in northern region and upper east region, which are poor regions, more people became poorer between 2013 and 2017. And in fact, between this period, 1% increase in GDP is associated with just 0.07% reduction in poverty rate. And that tells you that the growth has been there, um, but it appears few people ended up benefit, benefiting from this growth. Again, we haven't had that corresponding investment in the agricultural sector, which employs majority of people. Various governments have promised to industrialize, but we haven't seen that much industrialization. We haven't seen much um, mechanization in agricultural sector, which um, when we get much investment, we will lift a lot of people from the poverty bracket. Thank you so much. Uh, Guildfred Aziama there from, the, from Afro Barometer. Uh, that is where we're going to have to leave it now for Eye on Africa. Results from Monday from Monday's election in Ghana are expected on Tuesday. So do join us for our follow-up on that. Thanks for joining us. Do so again if you can. Take care.